One of the most common questions we get in cracking the code is, hey man, can you analyze my picking technique? Can you tell me what picking motion I'm making? Well, pff, come on, how do you not know what picking motion you're making? Are you dense? <clears throat> Sorry, fifth grade me acts up once in a while. Um, I'm kidding, of course. It's a legit question, right? If you've been playing for any length of time, when you're playing guitar, you're not really thinking consciously most of the time about the motions you're making. It's all memorized. It's all on autopilot. And yet, understanding some of that can sometimes be the fastest way to diagnose and solve common problems in picking technique. So what we did is we put together this sequence of lessons for our core instructional product, the Pixelanting Primer, on identifying common picking motions. And it goes beyond just like, okay, so it must be wrist motion. Which direction is it? What kind of phrases match up with that? And how do you determine these things? This lesson is one we've just sort of plucked out of that sequence. And we'll probably do that with a couple of these here on the channel. This one is about what we call the two o'clock wrist motion, which is maybe one of the most common picking motions of all time. You've definitely seen it. It's where the hand looks like it's moving side to side. But when you look up close, very often, what you will see is that in the case of the two o'clock motion, there's actually a slight diagonal pathway, and this diagonal trajectory is what gives this motion its string switching superpowers. For more on this, you can check out the Pixelanting Primer. Otherwise, let's get ready to identify the common and very effective two o'clock wrist motion. The two o'clock wrist motion, used perhaps most famously by the awesome Al Di Miola, is one of the most common picking motions of all time. Not just on electric guitar, but acoustic guitar, mandolin, pretty much anything with a pick. We call it a two o'clock motion because it kind of moves on a shallow diagonal from about two o'clock to eight o'clock and back again. And this is pretty interesting. We looked at this in our table tapping tests and at first glance, it just looks like you're moving your hand back and forth but it's that slight tilt to the arm while the hand stays flat on the desktop that tells you that something is interesting here because the hand is moving back and forth in a plane that's not the same as the plane that the arm is tilted in. So again, when you do that in the air, what you get is kind of a shallow diagonal. And it's the shallow diagonal that causes the escape when you place the motion on a guitar and do this. Downstrokes move away from the body and go up in the air, creating downstroke escape motion. When you watch Al play from face on, you would never suspect that there was any kind of diagonal nature to the picking motion. It just looks like his hand is moving back and forth. But on his classic REH instructional video, they gave us a camera angle where you can actually see it. Uh. When Al plays this single string pattern, you can see the downstrokes going up into the air. You wouldn't notice it if you weren't looking for it, but sure enough, there it is. The awesome Andy Woods technique is very similar to Al's. He also uses a two o'clock wrist motion as his primary motion for faster playing. Again, from audience perspective, you just don't perceive any diagonal nature to the motion at all. It's only when you look up close that you can see it. And even then, Andy's motion is not escaping the strings by much. Mike Marshall's downstroke escape trajectory is super obvious and even mentions it. The pick is almost going that way as opposed to this way, if that makes sense. Now the two o'clock wrist motion isn't the only alternate picking motion that Al uses. However, it is his primary for faster phrases. So for example, the famous Race with Devil on Spanish Highway being played here with the awesome Steve Vai. There's no visible variation in the motion. It just looks like the two o'clock wrist motion all the time. If there's any variation, it would have to be at the level of individual wrist motions, and we would need a magnet style camera to see that. And once again, that's even if it's happening. There are two common arm positions that are used with this motion. And you can recognize them by the anchor points, the thumb heel anchor point and the pinky heel anchor point. One of the, the common positions is when you have both the thumb heel and the pinky and you place them flat on the guitar like this. And the other one is when you take just the pinky heel and place it on the guitar and the thumb is not contacting or only barely contacting. And the difference between these two arm positions is super slight. You wouldn't even notice it if you weren't looking for it. When I use both anchor positions, and I place them on the guitar, you can see a small amount of squish here under the thumb. 
when I lift up the thumb just a tiny bit, you can see that curvature of the fleshy pad there kind of taking its shape again. And now the main anchor point is over here under the pinky. And that's the defining characteristic of this motion. Most of the time, when you look at players who are two o'clock motion, wrist motion players, you will see this pinky anchor almost always no matter what, where you have a small amount of squish right there where the pinky uh, meets the bridge on this guitar. And of course, when you look at Al Di Miola playing his Les Paul, that's exactly what you see. Al's hand is resting on the bridge with a small amount of squish right under the pinky heel there. That's the hint. That's how we know this is actually a slightly tilted arm position because that's what's causing the pinky to contact the guitar. The tilt in Al's forearm is slight enough that when you watch him play from face on, you would just think he's resting flat on the guitar, even though that's not really the whole story. Alternate picking pioneer Glenn Campbell is another two o'clock motion user. And he had a signature piece that he'd do in live concerts, the William Tell Overture where he would lift the guitar over his head while still picking, creating, accidentally, the world's greatest instructional video for two o'clock motion anchor points. Thanks to the happy accident of the camera angle, you get this totally awesome look at the pinky heel anchor, thumb heel anchor, and the diagonal downstroke escape nature of the picking motion itself. And I think that's a jazz three. <laughs> when you use the dual anchor point, the downstroke escape nature of the motion is a little bit easier to see because it's going up higher in the air. When you use only the pinky anchor point, that tilts the motion a little bit so that the downstroke escape isn't as visible. And this is very often how Andy Wood plays. Yeah, my reference point is actually this part that's calloused up, that nublet right that, there. The nublet. The nublet. Yeah. It's what, uh, I, I, don't, I don't roll around on it, Yeah. but I definitely feel it like, you know how the soft of your hand is right there? Yeah. I feel the soft of my hand and that, it's almost like there, there's a callus where that has just, over the years, mm -hmm. sat against, uh, you know, the bridge. He's leaning mainly on the pinky heel and just a tiny bit less on the thumb side. What you can also see in this close-up magnet view is a little bit of the underside of Andy's forearm. That's what gets exposed when you tilt a little bit more towards the pinky side. So those two things go together. The point here is not that you should micromanage the arm positions. The arm position doesn't cause the wrist motion. No matter what arm position you use, the wrist is just doing this, and the joint motion is exactly the same. So if you were to try to do this, and you used some sort of arm position that wasn't exactly the two that I'm describing here, you would still be able to do the motion just fine. All I'm really suggesting here is giving you a hint that when you see these kind of anchor positions in use, and principally when you see that pinky heel anchor, and you see the hand moving back and forth, that one of the things you should be on the lookout for is this downstroke escape, two o'clock style wrist motion. Now another thing you can look at is the pick slant, and that of course is affected by arm position as well. The pinky heel anchor produces almost none because you're tilting the arm and it kind of offsets whatever upward pick slant there might be. And so when you look at players like Andy Wood, for example, we can go back to that clip. You'll see almost no upward pick slant there. The pick is almost perfectly vertical. So this is an interesting case where the pick slant itself is not the thing that's gonna give it away. You're not gonna see some super obvious upward pick slant and go, aha, that's a uh, downstroke escape, two o'clock wrist motion. In fact, because of this, I think it's almost a misnomer to think of someone like Andy Wood as a quote unquote upward pick slanter. He's definitely a downstroke escape player, but very often you don't see much, if any, upward pick slant. And if you kind of think of it that way, you're gonna be looking for something that maybe isn't there. Once in a while, if you get the right camera angle and the arm position is just right, you can see an upward pick slant with this kind of two o'clock motion. And a great example of that is the awesome John McLaughlin. You can see this pinky anchor where you have a small amount of squish where the pinky meets the bridge. You can see in this shot right down the strings the way that John's downstrokes push away from the guitar body and you can definitely see the upward pick slant here. And sure enough, John really uses both anchor points in his playing. So he's resting on the strings, he may even be tilting a little bit more and that's where you get that more obvious appearance of upward pick slant. So the way that you can think about the pick slant in this case as, as a detective is if you see it, it's probably there. If you don't see it, don't imagine it's there because it might not be. 
this picking motion still works even with a zero degree pick slant. Right here, you can see I have almost no pick slant at all. And that's because I'm using a lot of edge picking. When you find exactly the right balance between the diagonal nature of the motion and the edge pick, you get a very smooth pick attack. With no garage spikes on the downstroke or the upstroke. So if it's not the pick slant, then really what you're looking for here that's gonna kind of seal the case for you is the repertoire. This is a downstroke escape picking motion. And so like with most downstroke escape players, you're looking for even numbers of notes per string. And especially when it comes to common phrases like pentatonic scale, you're looking to see those phrases start perhaps uncharacteristically on an upstroke because that causes the last note on the string to be a downstroke. And that's what makes the downstroke escape string changes clean. And of course, Andy Wood is a great example of this. We played a lot of pentatonic examples in our interviews with him. And you can see when he does this fast, it's almost always upstroke, downstroke, escape, then upstroke, downstroke again, and then repeat. So, so many great two o'clock wrist motion players start pentatonic scales on upstrokes. John McLaughlin is another great example of this. He also has a ton of even numbered patterns that always start on upstrokes, like this awesome four note pattern. On every string of this cool pattern, John plays four notes starting on an upstroke and terminating on a downstroke, which of course sets us up to move to the next string cleanly and away we go. Like a lot of bluegrass tunes, the standard Fisher's horn pipe is typically arranged in such a way as to maximize the number of downstroke string changes. In fact, in the entire A section of this tune, there's only one moment when you have to play an upstroke and go to a new string. All the other string changes occur where the last picked note on the string is a downstroke. And so you could play this entire thing with basically with two o'clock wrist motion. When you look at great mandolin wrist players, this is very often what you see. Here's a pick stroke starting on the D string and going way up over the top of the A string and coming right back down again on the other side. That's how he does the string change. So we know this is downstroke escape wrist motion. We'll take a look at the forearm. We can see a little bit of the underside of Andy's forearm. This is similar to what we saw on guitar. He's using a little bit more of that pinky heel anchor. That's how we know this is a diagonal or two o'clock wrist motion. So those are the hints. You're building a case here. Do you see the hand moving back and forth? If you see other joint motions, there's not so much of them. It's mainly hand motion. Okay, check. Do you see this pinky anchor right there where the pinky meets the bridge? Okay, check. Do you see an upward pick slant? If so, fantastic. If not, hold that thought. What about the repertoire? Is it even numbers of notes per string? Do you see a lot of licks starting on upstrokes, terminating on downstrokes, and moving to the next string? If so, you pretty much know what you're looking at. Thank <laughs> you.